Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, March 19th, 2023. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the bear podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 688. And welcome back to the show is Dr. Edward Angelini Cook. Yay. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's one of those shows again, isn't it? The applause. Well, it's good to know that you're appreciated, that the audience... Well, you know, we always Welcome desired to, to have you to come on. Oh. I like to feel desired. That, that was, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm just gonna that was the... <laughs> David's like nope <laughs> that was the little like segue oh that's what that was beep beep Gary <laughs> what are we talking about today <laughs> David gets it anyways <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's because Dr uh edward is back with us uh it's landscape of relationships time yay and uh so we're going in a direction that might actually be pretty interesting because i think this is the first time we've gone this away as opposed to Mm -hmm. i think other things are much more about dynamics between the people in our lives and i think we tend in this series to be more about like headspace and thinking about how we interact with people and what those things are. And since the topic is sexual desire, while that can be something of a thought process, I think others might feel that this is going to talk about us getting down, you know, into the, the nasty um, or what can lead to that, I guess is maybe a better way to look at that. Kind of be a let's talk about sex episode, but well, right. To be fair, like after <laughs> when I was like reading a little bit of what you know the notes are, and I was like, uh, "This probably could be a crossover to LTAS," but you know. Hmm. Um. I mean, I have to be honest. When I was kind of doing my research for this, <laughs> um, I was like, "Man, I could go in like a bunch of different directions here." Um. So. You know, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, I have, you know, just now we could go in a lot of different directions. So we'll see where this episode takes us. Okay. Well, we we can continue the conversation in another episode or two. Like, I mean, depending on if that's something that we feel is is necessary or not. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess my ask would be if people have any specific questions or you know thoughts let me know um so that can help guide yeah that can help guide my where where this episode goes right and and i think that um there's a there's a, a there's a lot of potential for how people think about this and so we might not necessarily get to that so i think that's good ed to say like hey if you have thoughts ideas questions like whatever to let us know and we can yeah um yeah because i think that was one of the things that you know when i was looking you know uh, 
sexual desire is something that I talk about a lot, not only with individual clients, but also my couples that I work with or my, my the people in relationships. So I'm like, yeah, this could go a lot of different ways because it's also very individual, but it's also really, um, it, it, we can talk about it from a relational standpoint. Um, and and again, it's it's a really broad topic. So you would say sexual desire is complicated. Oh, yes. Yep. That would be the the best way I'd, <laughs> I would I would describe it cuz <laughs> you know like you can like it you know um it can be is it an emotion? Sure. Um is it um a you know a uh, what else um Hold on, Damon. Let me <laughs> let me see here. Is uh, so like, it's is it a motivation, right? Uh, yes, that is also a motivation. Is it a state of being? Yes, right. I am I am desiring something right now. Um, but is it required to have sex? Um, not necessarily. Um, and that that's where I think people can, um, you know have some questions about that. Um, and that's what I, I oftentimes find with um, my couples and with the people that I'm working with. So I think it's important. I don't know if it, I haven't looked that closely. And so my apologies, this last point, do you expand on that a lot further or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, well, because the first thing that comes to mind is that sometimes people engage in sex as an activity because they feel it's, well, sometimes they feel it's the thing that they need to do. Other times, sexual activity, unfortunately, is put upon them mm. in a non-consensual situation, and therefore there is no desire. It is quite actually the opposite. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that is, um, that is important to remember. Um, but I think that, uh, coming from like, from my profession, right? Like we have been taught that, uh, desire is an important prerequisite in order to engage in sexual, um, behavior. Like when we think about the consent model, the fries, right? Like, um, you know, the that it should be excited we should be excited to engage in sexual behavior but like sometimes we're not right like sometimes um you know there are things that we've never done before sometimes there are things that we're just like Meh, about um and we we don't you know so, sometimes we don't have to be like you know over the moon ready and willing to do something in order to engage in sexual um activities right so but that's not saying that um sexual behavior that is non-consensual um is um a part of that right we're talking about um you know sometimes when we're especially when we're talking about a relationship um sometimes there there can be a desire discordance right where somebody has more desire than the other person to engage in something and we'll get into this, but like, you know, what, like what we have talked about in the past with like the smorgasbord, um, you know, sometimes the person that we're with really wants to do something, really has a desire to do something. And we're like, Meh, I could take it or leave it. Um, but like, sure, um, I'm willing to put that on the plate. Right. Um, right. So yeah. I, I want to circle back to something because I think you you touched on uh, an initialism that people aren't familiar with. So like in the Let's Talk About Kink series, we've talked about rack um, and we've talked about uh, safe SSC, safe, sane, consensual. Yeah. Uh, rack is risk aware consensual kink. Yes. Right, Damon, I'm looking at David. <laughs> um, Fries, sometimes it can be used in that, but I think it's it also is used a lot more in other uh, areas. So we're not talking about like nom nom, you know, like <laughs> potato, nope. deep fried. Um, so do you want to go over it or? 
Yeah, so um, so Fry's is a model of consent um, that people have used uh, in you know in recent histories, and it stands for free that consent is freely given. It's reversible. It's informed. It's enthusiastic and it's specific. Um, and what I'm talking about is the enthusiastic doesn't always. Um, we, I I have seen updated versions of this where the um, enthusiasm um, can be um, a question mark, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we can be open to something. Um, we, you know, the enth- enthusiasm isn't always going to be there initially, mm-hmm. um, especially when we're talking about, you know, like a lot of the work that we're doing today is um, on, you know, um, men's and also, you know, but, um, you know, but not always, right? Not everybody does, uh, identifies as, as men with this, um, with this podcast, right? However, when we are uh, talking about women and female sexual desire, sometimes um, that is responsive sexual desire, meaning that like it comes after, it's not spontaneous, right? Sometimes it comes after the the sexual the sexual behavior has begun. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Right? And I think it's also important to remember that sometimes that can be for men too, right? Because in same sex couples, um, that can also happen, right? Where I may not be, um, you know, like I I may not be in the mood for, you know, uh, a certain sexual behavior, but I might be in the mood for something else, right? So like, let's start with the something else and maybe it will lead into the thing. Maybe my desire will will come afterwards. Nice. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Like what I was just thinking of as an example, as you were saying that was how like some individuals um would be have been in their past individuals who participate in say anal but it's not really at the top of their list it's not necessarily something that they're inclined to go to right away um and i wouldn't necessarily talk about this in terms of like being a bottom versus a side but it's more like just like interest in in the participation so to speak or the actual act of that so i could see that someone might be like well you know, maybe we'll start with like, you know, cuddling and kissing and like a lot of touching and oral. And then that may end up leading to, you know, penetrative sex, but it doesn't have to. Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you for bringing that up. And I think that when we talk about like the smorgasbord, board, right, like what's on the menu, right? Um, what is, you know, what what is available to us? And um, you know, I think that all comes from communication, right? Like, you know, kind of setting the stage, uh, discussing what you're interested in and what you're not interested in, um, so that everybody's on the same page and so that there aren't any expectations that are, um, not met. Right. No, and and I think that's fair. So, I, you know, as um, we were saying, there's a couple different things about sexual desire um, for folks about, you know, whether it's an emotional state, it motivates people. Um, I find it intriguing as a state of being, uh, which we'll probably talk more about. Um, But yeah, I didn't mean to kind of like diverge things by focusing so quickly on like whether or not it's required. No, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get there. Um, I think that's an important part because when we talk about desire, there are so many things that impact desire. Um, and when I'm working with people who report any kind of discrepancy with, with desire, we have to talk about, um, sometimes we have to take desire off the table to talk about some of the things that are getting in the way of their desire um, being there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that maybe it's a good idea to kind of talk about what exactly sexual desire is. Mm -hmm. Um, So when we're talking about sexual desire, we're talking about the interest and or lack of interest toward engaging in sexual activity. So this can present itself with um, thoughts, feelings, and fantasies. 
Um, and, you know, some people look at sexual desire as existing on a spectrum, right? From like disgust and uh, to neutral to like super excited, right? Um, one way I have heard uh, desire talked about um, is uh, like akin to hunger. Um, and I like this anal analogy for some of the reasons like we have talked about previously in our um, in our discussions of like um, what uh, relationship anarchy um, and you know that like a lot of times we think that um, like desire is something that is external, right? Um, and I think that sometimes we have this idea that um, or we have this, or we have these cultural expectations that desire is something that is put upon us. Um, and I really want people to understand that it, it is something that comes from within you, um, like a, mm -hmm. like a hunger, um, mm -hmm. and that, you know, it can be there or it's not there, right. It can ebb and flow. Um, sometimes you're hungry and sometimes you're not, and that's yeah. not necessarily a problem. Um, and, Oh, Gary, were you going to say something? Well, I, I was just going to say that I think it's important for folks to understand that, like, what we are um, force fed. I don't know how else to phrase mm. this. Like, how media is represented, how culture comes across. Mm -hmm. the, the quote unquote norm or baseline is that we are all sexual beings and desire is just the name of the game, like that you desire other people, people desire you. And that's totally the norm. Like that's mm -hmm. that. And if you don't have that, I think people feel uncomfortable or they question things and they right. wonder if they're broken or there's something wrong with them because they don't feel that way about mm -hmm. other individuals. And it can become complicated, especially if you're on a journey of your own and discovery about yourself. And you say to yourself, well, like I like individuals of the same gender. What does that mean about me? Like, is mm -hmm. my sexual mm -hmm. desire dysfunctional or broken or wrong? Um, like it, it creates a, a lot of things. And I think I, most people who have probably listened to the podcast for quite a long time or, you know, know us probably are well aware that we're not thinking in terms of that. We're, you know, recognizing that there is a scale and it's like you could be anywhere on that scale from almost non-existent or none to, you know, yeah. you know, breathing air is yes. like equivalent to how <laughs> <laughs> ramped up you get. <laughs> I mean, yes. that's fair. I have, it's, it's funny because that was the thing when we started having this conversation about sexual desire. Like, yeah, I'm glad that sexual desire, there's a, a part of the definition that indicates lack of. Um, mm -hmm. Because you may not have sexual desire, but you shouldn't kind of know that that's okay. You know, we've, we've mentioned... Um, asexuality and demisexuality, I think, on the show in the past. And I think that's something that some people, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> and I think that's something that we don't often, we don't often think about because our society has dictated that, we, it's funny, we can be, we're sexual beings, but not too much. Um, we can have well, sexual desire, but not too much. Um, but don't and, get it twisted. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. But, the, but, the, but don't forget. Well, there's a large pop. I don't know if you want to say pop large. There is a population of people that think of of sex as procreation. Right. Period. End of story. No more. Right. And that's that's a whole other fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, because then I think that I think that will make things complex for individuals if they if their perspective is that sexual desire is about a mate and mm -hmm. procreation and creating offspring. And that's the end of it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think all of us on this podcast episode of this very moment realize that that's not all that there is. Um, and that I have you know, no desire to procreate. It's true. Um, well, 
Okay, so <laughs> I'm totally turning this podcast sideways for a moment. Everybody put a pin in where we're supposed to be. Uh, I have okay. fantasized about the concept of individuals, um, uh, the concept of breeding, but it is like a fruitless endeavor. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just gave it. Um, <laughs> but we still use that language. Right, 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 right. Right. God. Sometimes I'm okay with it, and sometimes I'm like, I need you to shut the fuck up. Well, I mean, so this is a whole other episode we'll have to talk <laughs> about. But I, th I think it's like, because it gets into, because I think that concept, I think that language, that vocabulary, that fantasy, all of that is about virility. That's about, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, this, this hyper-masculinism or, or whatever um, from that perspective. And, and that's a whole other aspect of sexual desire in, True. in that want to be with someone or have a fantasy or an imagination about what your experience is going to be like or what you would like yeah. it to be like. Uh, so I, I also think that um, when we're talking about sexual desires, right, um, and the lack thereof, but um, the lack or the interest in engaging in sexual activity, right? Um, let's kind of go back to the idea of the smorgasbord or like the... Um, uh, like the food court or the uh, the buffet, right? Um, and let's imagine that there is not a golden corral that can hold the variety of sexual desire, uh, you know, and how it, you know, how we think about that is, uh, are you familiar with rule 34 of the internet? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I'm kind of broken because we, because I know where you were going with this, but you were just talking about Golden Corral, and I was like, okay, yes, technically there's probably like porn about Golden Corral, but like that, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not, a I don't think porn? that's what you meant. I mean, you could have a sexual, like fantasy desire of being, you know, banged on the, on the corner of a Golden Corral, like it's 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 a, like the I don't I, it's been a minute since I've been in the Golden Corral. <laughs> like, you're not missing anything. I mean, I'm sure. But, no, that's uh, not true. What you're missing is humanity in a certain experience. Fair. Yes. <clears throat> um. So, but, anyways, like, right? That Rule Thirty Four is an internet meme. The concept is that um, pornography exists concerning every possible topic. Yes, right. every single sexual Literally. desire that, you know, if you can think about it, it exists on the internet. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about sexual desire, the limit does not exist um, <clears throat> uh, for that, right? We can, so, it, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when I'm working with people, right, and they come to me and they say, I'm having this, uh, you know, I like this or I desire this, uh, my only answer is, okay. Cool. Right? Like, you're going to, right? Um, yeah. It's interesting to hear you say that, Ed. I was just discussing this with a coworker about how <clears throat> in my work environment, I have been for a few years recognizing that people don't have the experience or the background or the knowledge that I have. And so they bring bias and judgment to the table. And they don't know that sometimes when they say certain things in conversation. Mm -hmm. and I, And it bothers me because... I'm like, you know, we've we've discussed it several times on this podcast that, you know, the slogan of don't yuck someone's yum um, because someone enjoys something like something experiences something doesn't mean it's for everybody. Right. And the thing for me is that um, I, I take a very neutral stance. I'm kind of like just because I may have never thought of that or considered it or been interested or I really don't care for it doesn't negate that for anybody else. Um, mm -hmm. I, I take a very simplistic principled stance of is harm being committed? Mm. That is the question. And, it, and that's very subjective because you would think it's an objective question. It's very, you know, yes, no. And it's like, mm, you, mm. Have to, you have to take a lot into account um, as to whether or not that is going to be an issue for people. So right, right, right. Yeah, it, it takes you know, time but and context, then... I guess. But even then, right, when we're talking about just sexual desire, right, mm -hmm. 
the limit doesn't exist and I'm okay with anything that people can desire. Right. right. Um, just, you know, in the context of desire, right. And fantasies, right. Cool. Tell me more about that. Right. Um, tell me more about what, what turns you on. Right. What, what kind of gets you going. Right. And I want to create this environment where people can talk to me about their, you know, everything that they're, that, that turns them on, that is very, very desirable to them because we live in a society, right? That um, kind of like Gary, what you're talking about, where um, you know some sexual desires are not okay, right? And I'm like, nope, we are. Um, I'm good with everything, right? Um, when we're talking about behaving on these desires or these fantasies, that's another conversation, right? Mm. Um, but anything mm, yeah. that like anything that exists within the mind, I'm totally okay with. Hmm. I find that intriguing, but that'll be a discussion for another time. Yep. <laughs> because there is a there is there is a reason there is um our mind is going it, it has a job um and sexually its job is to um and explore it's it's its job is to explore right um and the limit doesn't exist it's going to come up with things right um i don't always have the most rational thoughts um and everything i think i don't intend on acting on um it doesn't yeah. mean that like what i'm thinking is wrong um there could be there could be a purpose for it um but like if i'm not willing to explore it then i'm not going to and then i then i have a a a negative connotation associated with it i I think that's fair i don't know if everyone would agree with that perspective i think i think some will definitively feel like any entertainment of any thought is is in and of itself potentially an issue because I think people are concerned that if you entertain a thought about something that you may behave on it and Mm -hmm. that's when things can be become problematic. And and that's when we get into a sex negative society. Yeah. And I can see where I know just from personal experiences and growing up in certain communities that those thoughts that are beaten down, for lack of a better phrase, Mm. um, because they are perceived as wrong. I think Mm -hmm. that's the the problem in and of itself sometimes, is that like it's not necessarily a bad feeling or a wrong feeling. It's that because you're having it, you're putting something into existence that you will you will act on. And that's where a lot of these days are like, no, don't, you can't stop. Mm-mm. Yep. And, the, and there's, um, and that's why I think it's really important for people like myself, right, to keep on reminding people that there's a difference between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's kind of talk about like what impacts sexual desire, right? And, you know, we're coming out of this from what like kind of puts some pluses on it and what puts some minuses on it. So, um, you know, first it's important to know that, um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is based on, on statistics, uh, and that not all human behavior can be reduced to statistics. If this isn't your experience, it does not mean that you're not valid or that this doesn't apply to you. Right. Um, but uh, there's this really great book and it's called A Billion Wicked Thoughts. Um, it was, I think it came out in 2012, maybe. Um, it's right here. It's really, uh, it's really amazing. It's pre- It's probably... Uh, one of the best books out there on sexual desire. Um, and what they did was they looked at people's internet searches to, de- to determine what kind of patterns people were, what was kind of on people's minds, right? And what they were looking at, what they were, um, what they were sexually into. Um, so when it comes to like from a biological and evolutionary uh, standpoint, 
age can be a factor, right? Like um, when we are going through puberty and when we are, when we are just sexually active, right. Um, you know, our sexual desires can be through the roof. Right. Um, and as we get older, right. Those can wane, um, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that can be a thing. Um, you know, a lot of times people say that even testosterone can be a factor and, you know, testosterone tends to decrease as we get older. Um, one of the other things is that we have sexual desires uh, for the propagation of the species, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Um, and that for, for men specifically, um, you know, sex can be seen as a reward, um, from a neurobiological standpoint. Um, it really, uh, hits on a lot of those, uh, parts of our brain, right? So, um, so sex is very rewarding and that's the same for, for women too, right? Mm. When, um, a lot of times, um, women will say that, um, they don't want to engage in something that is painful, right? So if women associate sex as painful for them, why do they want something if it's not rewarding, right? Mm. Um, so, um, Gary? <laughs> well, no, I was, I was going to say, but that's true for all of us. Like, I oh, think yeah. that's, I think that's a, a, a significant reason behind why um, individuals may be reluctant to be anal receptive or to even um, like continue that as a behavior because they they find physically it's not enjoyable or it doesn't you know uh, I don't know the simpler way I guess to phrase it is to say it, you know the ends the don't justify the means like they're just like nah like this you know I'm good. I, yep and and I think the schism that gets created is that there are other people who are like enthusiastic and they don't I guess uh, one way to look at it is they don't respect boundaries or like perspectives and they're kind of like what do you mean like because to them they're like you know this is the best thing that's ever been invented besides oxygen you know and um, and others are like no sorry yeah yep hello welcome to my dissertation <laughs> right? um, uh, and there are so many factors that go along with that right like a lot of uh, a lot of people think that um, oh well because this is painful and because i had a negative experience this means um you know that uh you know the messaging that we get surrounding anal intercourse right is that like well it's supposed to be painful um and that like oh, okay well if it's sports supposed to be painful then i don't need to talk about this right and also mm-hmm. let's also add on the fact that anal sex is there's a lot of stigma associated with it so yeah. um you know i'm more likely to not talk about it then right and then also put in why would this be something that i would talk to a doctor about if it's not something i need in order for my uh, for me to have sex right like right. i can do other mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. um so there's, oh my God, I could talk about that for obviously ever. I mean, ever, it was, never, if it was your dissertation, it's kind of, you kind of have a, kind of have a meaty claw <laughs> into it, like. <laughs> mm-hmm. No yeah. pun intended. Um, totally intended. Oh, okay. <laughs> totally. Yeah, Absolutely. but I, I, I mean, I think that's fair, but that's, I think that's true across the board. I don't think that yeah. individuals realize that, 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 you know, there may be something happening that you're completely unaware of as to why this is not an enjoyable experience. Fill in the blank with whatever the thing is. And, you know, people not necessarily, you know, realize that. And that, you know, things change over time. You know, the whole human body, the body you have today is not the body you had in the past. In fact, it's not the same body on, you know, a cellular level many times over, depending on how old you are. And, you know, we've seen that science has said that, you know, your taste buds do get regenerated, replaced physically over time. And that is a part of the process that they point towards as to why people's tastes change as they age. You know, when we're younger, we have certain tastes. And as we get older, we find that we're okay with things. Um, And I find that very intriguing. I've been paying attention to that, especially in terms of like uh, the realm of like alcohol, how I'm noticing that like bitters – and like bitter agents, astringent type things are like of a certain age grouping. And I found that very intriguing. And, and the reason I bring it up is because I'm like, I have a funny feeling it has to do with the fact that your taste change. And that when you're younger, you're like, that is absolutely disgusting. And then as you age, like your taste kind of change. And then you're like, oh, that's not necessarily like, you know, repulsive or whatever. Um, you know, and so I'm not saying that everybody immediately goes from dislike to like. 
but they mm -hmm. may find themselves somewhere in between. Right. Awesome point. Way to also kind of use this whole hunger analogy, right? Um, that like sometimes we're, we're, we're hungry for things that like we weren't hungry for five years ago. Right. And I think the same, but I, but I also kind of want to just reiterate that like um, nothing that is um, sexually scripted is required um, in order for pleasure. Right. Like, so like, um, that was one of the things that I put into my dissertation um, discussion was that, like, you know, I think that one of the biases on my dissertation is that, like, anal sex um, or anal intercourse is required, um, and and it's not, right? Like, there are, we can have a, a, a healthy sexual um, <laughs> life um, without ever having anal, anal intercourse, right? Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it is not... Um, it is not required. Um, and research shows that as far as like gay men or MSM, um, they, uh, anal sex is lower on the actual sexual behavior um, when you compare it to like other sexual behaviors. Mm. Oral sex, oral sex is the winner there. I can't imagine why. I mean, so. Um, <laughs> For those of you who are listening to the podcast, you might not have picked up the sarcasm of that. So just so you know, <laughs> anyways. Um, so, so one of the, so to kind of continue, right. So like, as far as like um, male sexual desire, um, there are two things that are, are um, really important neurobiologically. That is our amygdala, that is, that is our emotional center and our hypothalamus that is responsible for um, sexual arousal. And because of those, those two things, um, a lot of men's desire is more based on visual cues um, rather than uh, women who are more emotionally uh, sexually driven um, or sexually desired. Mm. Um, so, uh, so for men, it's all a lot of it is about. Um, Ooh, look at that! That's hot, right? So, <laughs> um, you know, so we're so, you know, for so yeah, and uh, you know that is also. Uh, I think a, a lot of um, interaction of a lot of different factors, yeah. right? Um, I also wonder if how much of that is innate and how much of that is socially constructed. Um, but a, fair point. Uh, a lot of when you when you look at a lot of the things that men desire, uh, a lot of it is very visually stimulating for them. Well, right. I will say this. Um, this actually came up in a conversation with me recently. I think hormones are a big factor in that. Um, mm -hmm. Testosterone has been noticed, I guess I'll put it this way, to cause like individuals to exhibit a, a lot more interest in individuals. And a lot of that interest is like linked back theoretically to procreation, but can also like, as you were saying at, you know, be a piece of the visual stimulation. Um, yeah. And so, because there are, there are cisgender women um, who females who have high sex drives and may have, you know, I don't know any studies offhand, but might have a correlation that they have a higher, like, you know, hormone balance that would like, be considered justification as to why that is. Um, and, but I think again, like a lot of it is, you know, we always talk about the average or the norm or whatever, you know, and because this is sort of a taboo area, we really, as a human species, haven't delved into this, I think with enough diligence to know one direction or another. And so we're, sometimes I feel like we talk in like, uh, foggy terms of speculation because we just don't know we can't say with certainty right exactly and and that you know again right um shifting right back to that disclaimer that like you know uh, this this does not have to be for everybody's experience right like sometimes there are like you said right um uh women who have like very high sex drives right so like some of these aren't going to apply to them um and um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it is really interesting and, uh, I'm very curious about certain stuff, like even, um, like one of the, the topics of this, of this book that I'm referencing is about like, why do we like what we like, right? Like why is 
Why are the things that we desire the things that we desire? And one of the concepts that I think is really interesting is um, this idea of cued interest versus uncued interest. Um, and a, a cued interest is when we don't really know why we desire something we just do. And for the, the book, um, they talk about how for, for men and even gay men, um, based on their, their search histories, are very similar in, the, in their cued interests about the things that they don't know why they desire. So the things that um, men desire uh, based on, on, these, um, on this research is uh, chest, butt, um, feet, and penises. That goes for straight men, too. Huh. Right? Because even in even in straight porn, even um in um you know cisgender straight porn, a lot of the search history for the for the for the straight men is they want a big cock, right? They they, they want a big a big penis present um because that is very alluring to them. Isn't that interesting? You kind of uh, broke my brain. It's a it's uh, a I replacement know. thing, right? It's it's kind of like they want to want the cock that's doing the thing that they're watching because they're putting themselves in the place of the person that's doing the fucking for the woman. Right, so right, right. No, I, I I think you're spot on, Jeff. That's the part that blew my mind is I was like, what? I was like, because when Edward, you said that, I was like, wait, straight men I mean, care about a big penis? But then I was like, oh. Well, thank right. yeah. I, like I've oh god, sorry. Hold on, break break my brain for a second because it just like I'm looking back on like the years and years of like straight porn you used to watch or the, the you know magazines or all of these things, and I'm thinking back on it. There are no small dicks. Like I'm, <laughs> this sounds bad, but like well, when you think about it. Not usually. Not usually. They're right. not usually like they're usually big penises. Like I'm remembering because that's kind of what I was looking at. You know, like 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 I I I get that now, but it makes sense that that's something that they would want to see because it it's the it's the 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 flip in the mind or the the that's me. Like I'm the one doing that. I'm right, the one because the big penis doing the things in exactly because pornography, yeah. watching individuals is typically the 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 observed fantasy that we desire, like what we want to experience. In most mm -hmm. cases, I won't say a hundred percent, but like so, it makes perfect sense why it's like you want someone who is not you or has different attributes than you, right? To because that's and and. I just never really thought of that. Like I, I don't, I, I gotta, I gotta come back to this in my subconscious when I sleep tonight somehow. Like I gotta, <laughs> I gotta deal with this because I'm just like I never imagined or thought about the fact that straight men want to watch porn with big penises because like that is what their fantasy is. Is mm -hmm. that is that they have something that derives, presumably, derives more pleasure for the partner. I, right. I just, and a lot of that. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, go. Yep. I just, <laughs> to, to, just as kind of a side note, I find this funny that Gary and Damon's minds blew, and I'm like, oh yeah, that made sense. It it just it it it. I went back <laughs> to like like ten, twelve year old Damon watching the videos with his older brothers, not. Mm -hmm. more, you know, but like they found the porn, like because I've mentioned this in the past, like they they're watching the porns or looking at the, the the magazines and stuff, and you look at those and you see it's usual, like the combination is usually there's usually bigger, like like the the virile, the the huge dicked men, right? Like it it it's it's in, it's ingrained in there, but and and I, you know, it just it it made me realize like that now makes sense. And then going back to like that, seeing that and going, okay, now it all makes sense because it's like you said, it's the fantasy element. It's the like that's me. 
that's me doing that. Even though it doesn't necessarily look like me, right? That's me. Well, and I think there's also like a a, a potential that that carries from a, a genetic, biological, like predetermined kind of like psychology, like that in the in the procreation, the carrying on of the species, that we look for that we expect that other individuals want certain attributes out of their partner. And so yes. like a, across many animal species in the animal kingdom, like certain things are the are the, the stuff that kind of like wins out, so to speak. Um, and so it wouldn't be a surprise to me if like human brains look at genitalia a specific way and interpret that as like, you know, a better partner, whether or not that actually has any technical bearing is, is you know, to be decided otherwise. It's just about the the presumption or the like, you know, and to be fair, we we eat with our eyes, um, you know, so the the visual is incredibly important in our determination of what we want or what we desire or what we're looking at thank you for that and i i uh that I, yes definitely we eat with our eyes you know i think a lot of what this book talks about or what a lot of the research talks about is men eat with their eyes right um if we're if we're if we're talking about um sexual desire like a hunger that's a wonderful analogy thank you gary um and Oh, I was going to say something. Uh, but to your point, though, like, so there is another theory called relational construct theory um, or relational framework theory, I'm sorry, that says that, like, our human mind, in order to process, in order to make things make sense of things, it creates categories um, and, it, and it, it creates these relations between things, right? And, and a lot of those are sometimes hierarchical, sometimes they are categorical. You know, think about it, like, from a statistical standpoint. And um, because of that, it creates bias and it creates um, this um, envy, right? So like talk about the um, the or origin of penis envy, right? That like we are constantly always comparing ourselves to something that is bigger. And when, when I talk to my clients, there's always going to be somebody or something that is better somebody who is worse, somebody who is um, always, always. So why are we comparing ourselves? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. of course, this also does, this does, this does, the little of, this doesn't do any favors for our trans, um, our, our trans community, right? When we talk about um, penis size, right? Um, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's another kind of conversation there. Um, but, you know, uh, that's been something that we have, um, I have seen a lot of um, discourse about, about, you know, changing the way that we talk about penises, um, because, you know, that, that isn't very helpful. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I see why you say like this can go in a lot of different directions and can be discussed a lot of different ways about right how how we view things, um, yeah, and then do we discuss them or how how they are explained or a part of our culture. So here's something else that's going to blow your mind. I love this, um, and I think that we could have some some great combo on this. But there is this um, other con oh. So the other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is uh, quickly is with acute interest. Um, so, you know, we don't know why we desire something. So that's what I was talking about, some of the like evolutionary biological drives of those. Um, but then there's uncued interest, um, which always has an origin story. So I think this is very relevant with um, with us within the bear community is we always we always I, I have not heard from any person in the bear community who doesn't have an origin story about what man they first looked at who was really, really hot to them that fit the bear um, kind of prototype. Like for me, it was Tom Selleck and John Goodman, right? Um, but like these are, um, these are the, the, the sexual desires that we have that have an origin story like like, you know, that uh, propagate the, the bear identity development, but then also specific sexual desires. Like if there is, if you're into like, uh, I don't know, um, some kind of kink or, you know, just something that is 
uh, like really hot for you, sometimes there's a story that goes along with that. Interesting. And usually it is, um, it originates around an orgasm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this episode's a thinker. Me. Um, it well, does make I, sense. I, I, right. I was going to say, if not orgasm, then arousal. Uh huh. Because uh, so, as I as the as the precursor to the orgasm, I guess. I yes, I would say so. There's a sexual imprinting that goes along with it. And I think that orgasm is the process that imprints it onto your um, menu <laughs> in, in, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, it, and maybe I've made this up in my mind, that there are individuals who find themselves aroused or turned on by things and really, um, you know, interested in something. And they do have their origin story, but, you know, the fact that they have a fetish for shoes, they didn't necessarily have sex involving a shoe. Do you understand what I'm saying, Ed? Like, like that's why I'm mm-hmm. like, I, I like, I think arousal is totally a piece of that, not necessarily that. Especially, I'm also thinking in terms of, like, age. Like, you know, when you when you first start having physical arousal, and then, you know, what that may turn into, I guess. I think 12 to 13 is a really um, interesting age for a lot of young adolescent men. Um, and I think that when we're talking about this um, process, I think that's when some of these are happening. Um, mm-hmm. And again, right, like this isn't for all, um, but like ones that you are like, oh, yeah, this is my origin story with this. Um, I think that sometimes there's patterns um, surrounding like that age and, um, you know, things like that. Like your first kind of sexual experiences, Mm -hmm. which is, I find that really interesting. Um, So something else that's really interesting is this thing called the absolute, absolute territory. Um, It comes from a Japanese term that uh, I am, going to say um, and I apologize um, Zate um, Raiki um, the tire thank you Damon um, yes. and what that's what that comes from is the um, you know when you're looking at um, hentai but also uh, manga um, the uh, the uh, Art um, of the bottom of the uh, the woman's skirt um, to the top of her socks, that band of skin that you can see is very desirable um, for men. And we also see rep- representation of this throughout history, like um, you know, women with their ankles um, and also earlobes um, and. Um, you know, that like, it's the one thing that you can see, um, that is very desirable. Um, and I often think about with say bears, right. When, uh, a bear will kind of stand up and kind of maybe do a stretch and you see like the top of their, you know, their belly, or like, you can see kind of like, um, like their crack, right. Like you, there's some, uh, there's some skin in between the bot, the top of their pants and the bottom of their shirt. I don't know about you, but that is, is super hot for me. <laughs> right, Jeff, your AC. Mm. <laughs> and it's the heat, not the AC. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the unit. Just do a Fonzarelli, you know. Just hit it with your fist, and it'll hey. calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but the, such an antiquated statement I but just I, realized I, anyways I get what you mean but there I'm, I'm thinking back on things and like yeah like the the V like an open shirt for a guy that it's you're not seeing necessarily like 
nipple or chest per se, but you're just getting that like um, pop the pop of chest hair. Yeah, the pop of chest Fuck hair. Me. Right. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> it's, it's male cleavage. Yeah. Quote unquote. Oh. You know, in sense, yeah. Um, but I, 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 I will um, like the 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 ass crack or the occasional ass crack or just the belly the belly pop is what I call it like the like just oh the belly little, pop yes. yeah <laughs> just a little bit of like when like when a guy lifts a shirt or you know anything along those lines or lifted her arms and you just get like the like the pop of the belly like the right there and it's usually not a long you know moment but it's there and it's just kind of fun to see. So to go back to our um, our conversation about socks. <laughs> just wearing one piece of clothing is like torturous um, for people because it's that very liminal space between being fully naked and dressed. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I find that intriguing because of like because if that's true as a concept, then technically only wearing a shirt should do the same thing. Right. Or only wearing a sweatshirt or only wearing shorts. Right. Or only wearing a jock. Mm-hmm. You're, you're hitting like, yes. yes. But I'm using all of those as examples of disagreement. Like I, I know many <laughs> of people who are okay with those things. Like just that one article of clothing, it doesn't bother them or disturb them or, yeah. you know, so maybe yeah, I know a like, lot of people so- which that this doesn't apply to. I don't know. <laughs> Well, no, like, when I say, like, torture, it's, like, like, torture. Like, I want that, but I, I don't know. Like, like I want you, <laughs> like, I want you more because you just have that one thing on. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not, like, torture, like, bad, like, aversion. Torture as in, like, fuck. Oh, okay. Like, okay. major turn on. Can't be like, <laughs> major Can't turn you? on because because of the uh, 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 the desire is like oh you've, you've got socks on oh and for me it's like for god's sake take those fucking socks off but I know people in particular where well they're into gear or they're, they're into like right. so like the more you have on the more that you're concealing, the more that you're you're um, not revealing, it's kind of the titillation for them. Are seeing the imprints, you know, in in the in in like a fabric or whatever. Like for example, wearing yeah. a really tight like um, lycra or spandex, and just having that so that you can see like the nipples or the dick print or what have you. Um, are like I love like one of my things I've I've learned in recent years that I kind of really enjoy is super tight underwear like a where you can see the cuppage of the butt like like crack everything like you can kind of get it and, and that kind of like I really like that and I can see where that entices me and I'm recalling memories of a um Friend, no, friend's not the word, acquaintance that I knew while I was in college. Um, um, Actually, there were a couple that lived nearby my, um, where my parents lived, where my mom lived. And they enjoyed, they walked around with just like t-shirts on. Because the idea was that it gave enough coverage, but all you just need is just to lift up or move over and it's you're you're there. Like no, like no underwear, maybe socks, but I know it was definitely like like they walked around like bottomless. I just saw a TikTok with this guy, um, this older guy, and um he had on like, you know, those um gym shorts uh with nothing on underneath, and it was uh the the song under uh the song associated with it was uh, the I made you look, <laughs> and it was like you could like you know he was kind of moving in a way you couldn't see anything, but it was like oh my god if I could just move my phone this way maybe I'll see something. Um, you know it's just 
drives you crazy of the, right. the of like what you can't see. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I also think about, you know, burlesque and like that was really hot for, right. uh, you know, at that time where like, you know, they would just take off one article of clothing and men would just go bananas. Yeah. It's the, it's the what you can't see. It's the what you, you want to see it, but you can't see it. I don't or like you being teased. won't see it. I don't like, like being teased. Of, and, yes. and that's fair, but some people really do. They love the tease. They love the titillation of the tease. Um, and I mean, that's what, like, I mean, strip shows and, and, and strip teases and all of that, that's kind of the, 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 the point of them. Exactly. Isn't that fascinating? I love it. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about how, like, um, you know, desire can, um, can have, or, uh, what can, like, impact desire in a, um, decreased way um so you know we're talking about the importance of like testosterone or the role of testosterone well having low testosterone can um can have a a, an impact on your on your uh desire um also some for especially men heart disease um cancer um physical pain like we've talked about like you know sexual pain I don't really want to do this. Um, And then also psychotropic medications have been known. One of the side effects is um, that can have an impact of of sexual desire and your libido. Um, And when we're talking relationally, uh, since this is the landscape of relationships, um, relationship conflict um, can uh, can impact sexual desire with that person and also sexual scripts. Um, So there's a lot of research as far as you know, as a relationship goes on, sometimes the sexual desire kind of decreases. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that it's, it's decreased. Right. Um, and so, so that can be, and also, um, so what, Oh, so I was just going to ask about sexual scripts. Yeah. I'm, I'm, is that like the, the routine kind of becomes routine and it's the same, like thing every time yeah um but then also it can be like when we associate when we have possibly some anxiety about um our sexual script um the way that our partner may show up and and enact their part um may start to bristle us um where we're like Mm. oh i i know what's about to happen um and then I, i i'm not responding to it in a um desirable way I'm, I'm i'm i have like a literally a bristle response hmm. Hmm. interesting and um but then also like you know the sexual scripts can be uh can be influenced by gender roles can be influenced by you know cultural roles it can be you know if we live in a sexual negative society which we'll kind of get into so i don't want to spoil that um so i want to put a dot 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 there um but then also um abuse right like are the histories that we that we bring into a relationship i call those kind of like the um you know the the things that are um the stories that we tell ourselves right our own personal history um that can have a an impact to to sexual uh desire right so if i have any history of like childhood abuse or any kind of abuse that will negatively impact my desire, especially with maybe even my body, um, about the other person's body. Um, and then also think about like religiosity, um, you know, like what has that, um, the history, the religious history that we're bringing into a relationship. Um, it doesn't matter if we want to engage in stuff. Some of those ghosts, um, follow us, um, and have unconscious, unconsciously present itself within our relation within our relationship and also culture Mm. yeah that makes sense yes it does i think this could we'll discuss in post show i have (laughs) about about another episode Um, something you just said anyways and 
And then when we're also talking about like psychologically, um, you know, like inch, like with ourselves, right. Um, anxiety can, like I said, like the bristling, um, uh, but then also having like unhelpful, uh, the relationship that we have within our, with our own body, our own sexual narratives that, uh, may be, that don't have to be abuse related, um, but are just, um, just unhelpful yeah. narratives that we're bringing to us, uh, uh, a relationship and then other sexual di uh, disorders. So like if I experience erectile dysfunction or if I experience uh, premature ejaculation, uh, my desire, um, you know, my experience with sex, it might not be a, what I'm considering positive one based on the, mm. the sexual scripts that I have or the sexual uh, skills that I have. Um, so then I don't really want to engage in something that is not pleasurable. Um, mm. And then socially, we are we can be motivated uh, by uh, the dominant cultural se uh, sexual narratives and scripts, which could then Im um, impact our overall sexual desire. Right. Yeah, we know of many people who, I mean, this we've we've probably met those people who suppress their homosexual sexual desires because they were societally told to um that your goal is to get married and have children and and eat a woman and have sex with a woman and all of that and they repress that other aspect of themselves those desires for the sake of society our religion are something else um, and that leads me to kind of like my maybe last thought, but um, the idea that, um, so there's this quote by um, an author of a book that I love called Passionate Marriage, which also talks about um, a lot of sexual desire within relationships or marriages, um, that for most of Western civilization, low sexual desire has been the goal, not a problem. Mm, that makes so much sense. Which is kind of funny because you, when I, you know, I'm thinking about this and then I think about the opposite when so many sexual things are thrown at us all the time and so much of it, like in media and commercials and TV and, and everything we're thrown this like very highly sexual like commercialism for lack of a better phrase but we are told to not act on those desires we are almost berated um for when we act on those sexual desires particularly um women bingo so like there is this huge medicalization of um, of women's sexuality and desire where like there are disorders uh, for hyposexual um, uh, desire for women. Um, but like we live in, you know, in a sex negative world, it's no wonder that women and also other people are so confused about their own sexual desires and lack thereof. Right. Um, when you tell women and you put so much restrictions on women's sexuality and women's reproduction um, and and then you're like, why don't you want to have sex with me? <laughs> well, Jesus. <laughs> right. I right. God, it just it's so funny how conflicted our society. Not funny. It's kind of devastating, really. How conflicted our sexual you know our society is regarding sex we yep. have all of this like we know you know for in most people are in general um sexual desire is innate it's it's there um but we're told from a young age to not act on it to not express it even. Um, 
And because of that, we are left with these, no wonder we're all fucked up, but we're left with all of these like issues because of some of the things that were being shown when on the flip of that, we're kind of throwing it in our faces. Um, and when someone kind of breaks out of all of those, you know, pressures and norm, um, what is considered the norm and societal like biases and what have you, and realizes it's all okay, then they're seen as the freak, the weirdo, the slut, the what have you. And it's so weird where if if we could just stop that mindset, stop that, you know, being a thing, repressing it, how, I hate to say how wonderful, but how different would the world be? Yep. So, um, you know, uh, to go back to this, the smorgasbord idea, right, like the sexual smorgasbord, if dominating cultural narratives um, are creating this uh, smorgasbord, then there are only going to be a few options for only a few people, and then the rest are going to be closed, right? Like there are so many, you know, I think that, you know, from a historical standpoint, sex is for men. Right. I think this could be this could be due to the fact that people find choice overwhelming and by that i mean having more than a, a handful of possibilities makes it difficult for people to make choices or to know what they want to do or what they could <laughs> choose to experience and uh, i think the other thing to uh, that is a factor is um what you know the question of what is sex um that like i think that um or i know that a lot of people think sex is one thing right it's penetration um when it's so much more uh than one thing uh that if we can like expand out and you know to to kind of see that there are a lot more options um at the you know the smorgasbord available to them that they are already doing um that they're more likely to choose one or two things and not the whole thing right mm -hmm. like i think that when it comes to sexual scripts sometimes people are like well i know it's going to end in x um so then i don't want to do it i don't want to do it at all mm. so if i'm yeah. here and i'm saying okay but what if it was just a b and c oh i'm okay with that there you go right that's sex. Yeah. It's funny because I was just thinking the other day, like, I get hit on all the time about people wanting to be fucked. And in recent years, I have learned that's not really what I want to do. Um, so most of the time, I don't engage. Like, mm -hmm. ugh, I hate so, so many times. And I just... You know, if if you're and if I'm looking at your profile and like you're all about like I want to get fucking da, da da da, I'm like I like I don't you know I'm not even gonna bother like like I don't I would like to have a conversation and have us discuss what we want to do together instead of you immediately demanding something of me, mm. right? Because as you said, like the road like the road is supposed to lead to X. Well. I don't want to go to X. So I maybe if we go to Y or maybe T, like, you know, I'll be okay. And I think we could both potentially enjoy it. Mm hmm But if all you want to do is that, then I, I, we're, we're, I'm good. Like, I don't need to, I don't need to engage you because I know what your end goal is. And that's not, my end goal. And if we come at it from that, my sexual desire just went out the window. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. If I know that like, oh, okay, I can get on this highway. Uh, I don't have to get off of that exit. Cool. Yeah. I can, I can, I can take a detour. 
So, you know, that's why, you know, when we talk about sides, um, you know, I, um, I think that my <laughs> way of, about it is a lot, uh, more, uh, I don't know, like, you know, a lot of times when I talk to people who are sides, a lot of them are like, I just tell them that I'm not into anal sex or that. And I'm like, and how does that work out for you? Um, or are you saying, this is what I am interested in? How about we lead with what we do want to do? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what options are on the smorgasbord before we tell people what is not there? Mm-hmm. People are more likely to respond to what is there versus what isn't there. I can't work with what's not there. True that. And like we were talking about with responsive desire, um, you know, there are some people who, you know, maybe quasi sides, right? Who are <laughs> like, it really depends on the context. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, this is what I know. If we get together, this is what is definitely going to happen, right? Um, depending on certain stuff you know, from the fries model, right? It is um, negotiable, right? It is, um, um, it can be added and it can be taken away. Mm. Right. <laughs> so there you go. That's my take on sexual desire. <laughs> this is my thesis. That's a lot to think about, but I appreciate it. Yeah. There's, oh. I, I, I can see where this conversation could have gone in so many different directions. I can see where it would be hard to, I mean, I appreciate what we did, and I'm glad you were able to narrow it down in a sense, but I could see where we could have veered off into this, you know, a certain category, or we could have gone into this, you know, into a different like lane, as it were. So it was, it was quite informative. I appreciate this. I really do. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad. I, uh, um, you know, just to be uh, upfront, <laughs> I was a little like, I don't know what the hell to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much. I was, I, li- I have a stack of books here next to me that I was like, do I talk about this? No. Do I talk about this? Nope. <laughs> well, I think it's important to know that, like, wow, there's more that can come from this conversation. Yeah. So, if, you know, like I said before, if people have questions or if they are like, "Ooh, that was really interesting," talk more about that. Um, yeah, uh, I feel like I, I definitely have a lot more other highways I could go down. Right. One thing I've learned about from this session is uh, make sure you communicate what you do desire less than what you don't. Right. Not saying don't communicate what you don't desire. Just start start with what you do. Well, I mean, and, you know, we're, we've been using the hunger analogy, right? Um, sometimes, sometimes the conversation is, what are you hungry for? I don't know. And then the next question is, well, what are you not hungry for? Mm. Um, well, I don't want, I don't want this. Okay. So like we can narrow it down. So like I can see how that can be helpful. Right. But if I'm going, if I'm entering into a sexual situation, it's really important that I should know what I'm kind of looking for from that interaction. Mm-hmm. Right. And what I do desire. Mm. <laughs> And with that, that's the end. Oh, oh, sad. Well, there's plenty of way to contact us about any of this. What is your sexual desires? We would love to hear. You can do that in many ways, such as commenting on our blog at cubsoutloud.com, doing an email at cubsoutloud.gmail.com, or sexually telling us on our hotline. At 361-COL-TALK, that's 361-265-8255. And then follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Or join our entourage chat at 
bit.ly slash telegram dash col. You can also find out when we're playing and recording these shows by checking out our Google Calendar at bit.ly slash calendar dash col. You can get various uh, extremes at Zazzle at Zazzle.com slash Gabzella. Shirts such as Consensus My Floor Play, a handy towel, uh, and many other other items. Some of those designs were designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a Patreon at Patreon, Patreon, Patreon at Patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. You can also send us a donation at PayPal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can find us everywhere. You can find podcasts on Play, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts, Google Play. I can't speak today. <laughs> Spotify, Amazon, Audible. Uh, please rate us, write, review us, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe, like, comment, and subscribe. The uh, more you do that, the more we get higher in the algorithm, the more people will find us. You can find me anywhere on the internet as box, set, box, puppy, box, cup, box, something or other. Damon? Sorry. I just suddenly started watering for some apparent reason. Allergies. Hi. If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me at theatercub79. That's T H E A T R E C U B 79. And most on both spare related sites are on Facebook. Or you can find me as pup underscore umber on Twitter. That Twitter is definitely not safe for work. If you want the safe for work, you can try DMA Gamer 79. Gary? If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gaber73. Ed. Okay. Oh, it's my turn? Okay. Um, <laughs> Gary, usually you hand that off. I am so sorry. I am distracted. I will explain in post-show. Go ahead, Ed. <laughs> uh, all right. So if you, um, uh, so I'm very active on Facebook. So if you want to follow me there, um, Edward AC. Um, I'm also on TikTok as dr.unicub79. Um, and then if you want to follow my Instagram, it's dr.unicub underscore sex brain wizard. I know it's a lot. And then um, for Twitter, um, I do have a safer work that is Eddie, E D D I E H Cook. And then if you want to follow my definitely not safe for work content, um, that is uh, Dr. Dot Unicub after dark. Um, but just send me a message before you do so I know who you are. <laughs> and with that, say good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Ciao for now. now.